Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning as we celebrate the second Sunday of Easter, as we continue focusing on the reality of the resurrection. And the reality of the resurrection today tells us that the living Lord gives us proof and peace. We'll follow the order of worship that's printed in your service folder. You can also follow along on the screen. Our opening hymn is hymn 453, The Tomb is Empty. and will forgive us our sins 
and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord.
Come to us also by word and sacrament, and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. As is customary in the season of Easter, our first reading is found in the New Testament book of Acts, reading from the 18th chapter. <clears throat> the promised presence of the living Lord gave Paul the courage to keep speaking the gospel, even when Paul was facing harsh persecution. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. Because, they, because he had the same occupation, he stayed and worked with them, for they were tent makers by trade. Every Sabbath, he led a discussion in the synagogue, trying to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was entirely devoted to preaching the word, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they opposed Paul and slandered him, he shook out his clothes and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. He left that place and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the synagogue leader, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, but keep on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to harm you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 16b. This is the day. You'll find it on page 9 in your service folder or on the screen.
in John's first letter, reading from the first chapter, where John reminds us that there were witnesses who saw and touched Jesus raised from the dead. And this resurrection serves as proof that eternal life is ours. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have observed, and our hands have touched regarding the word of life. The life appeared, and we have seen it. We testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We are proclaiming what we have seen and heard also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write these things to you, so that our joy may be complete. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Please stand and join in singing the gospel acclamation. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord. Congregation may be seated as we sing our hymn of the day in 456, O Sons and Daughters of the King. This morning we'll sing stanza one and then stanzas four through eight. Stanza one, stanzas four through eight.
peace are yours from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's word for our consideration this morning is found in our Gospel, John chapter 20. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts, may they be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Many years ago, there was an East Coast pastor, Pastor Wright, who visited a small Midwestern religious college, and he stayed at the home of the college president, who also served as the professor of physics and chemistry. After dinner, during the small talk that ensued, Pastor Wright declared that the end of the world must be near because just about everything about nature had been discovered and all inventions conceived. The young college president politely disagreed and he said that he felt that there would be many more discoveries. And Pastor Wright challenged him to name just one such invention. The president replied that within 50 years, men would be able to fly. Nonsense, sputtered Pastor Wright. Only angels are intended to fly. Pastor Wright certainly didn't think men would be able to fly. But he did have a couple of young boys at home named Orville and Wilbur, who obviously had a lot more vision for the future than their father did. What if the Wright brothers had shared their father's belief that men could not fly? What if Orville and Wilbur had been skeptics? Perhaps Pastor Wright reminds us of another skeptic, the main character in our gospel for today. Thomas is what we could call a late bloomer, I guess. He, like Peter and James and John, was a fisherman. He grew up around the Sea of Galilee. And when Jesus came a-calling at Capernaum, he followed. For three years, Thomas followed. But already during those three years, we start to see a hint of Thomas Thomas's character. Thomas is a pessimist. Rather than seeing the glass half full, Thomas always sees the glass half empty. It was Thomas who, when Jesus told them that he was going to Jerusalem, to the center of Jesus' opposition, in order to heal his friend Lazarus, almost sarcastically said, well, let us also go that we may die with him. It was again Thomas who spoke up as Jesus spoke of his departure from the world. Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Pessimism was not a new character trait for Thomas. It seems that doubts and, and pessimism had followed him almost all of his life. And the events of Holy Week certainly did help. Soon his whole world was falling apart. Thomas sees Jesus arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and with the rest of the apostles, he flees for his life. On Good Friday, he watches from a distance as they nail Jesus to the cross at Golgotha. And as Jesus' life drains away, so does Thomas's hope. Holy Saturday is a blur, so great is his shock. Some people, when confronted with the loss of a loved one, want to be with other people. Misery loves company, they say. But other people want to be alone. They don't want to talk to anyone. They don't want to see anyone. Our friend Thomas seems to fall into that latter category. He's so disillusioned on Sunday, Easter Sunday, that he doesn't even get together with the other apostles for the evening meal. And so on Monday morning, the apostles find him and tell him what happened. Thomas, we were in the upper room where we'd been meeting. The doors were locked. But suddenly, Jesus was there. Shalom, peace, he said to us. He shows us his hands and his side. We saw the nails. Thomas, he's risen, he's alive. I don't believe it, Thomas barks. I won't believe it. Not a word of it. You're seeing what you want to see. Jesus is dead. I saw him die and a part of me died with him. He's dead and the sooner you accept that fact, the better off you'll be. You can imagine his friends pleading with him, urging him to believe what they know to be true. You can hear the hurt 
and the bitterness and the doubt dripping in Thomas's reply. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hands into his side, I will never believe. Perhaps you can relate to Thomas. Perhaps you too have a hard time seeing the glass half full. Perhaps you also have doubts about how God operates. Perhaps you wonder why some suffer while others don't, why some prosper while others fail. Perhaps your life is full of questions of which you have no answers. Maybe instead of turning to your fellow believers for comfort and reassurance and help, you, like Thomas, try to go it alone. Maybe the words of this poem express exactly how you feel. Let me meet you on the mountain, Lord, just once. You wouldn't have to burn a whole bush, just a few smoking branches, and I would surely be your Moses. Let me meet you on the water, Lord, just once. It wouldn't have to be on the lake, just a puddle after the rain. I would surely be your Peter. Let me meet you on the road, Lord, just once. You wouldn't have to blind me on the highway, just a few bright lights on the way to church. And I would surely be your Paul. Let me meet you, Lord, just once, anywhere, anytime. Just meeting you in the Word is so hard sometimes. Must I always be your Thomas? And here's the hard thing, folks. Even if we don't feel exactly like Thomas, we can relate because we've all had doubts. Our, our world tells us that doubts are good. It's good to question things, not accept everything as truth. And when it comes to the things of this world, maybe that's good advice. But not when it comes to God. Doubt is unbelief. When we doubt what God says to us, when we doubt God's promises, we don't believe them. And we're all guilty of it, every single one of us, including me. We're all guilty of doubting something from God and his word. And so from one doubting Thomas to another, this is exactly why Easter is so important. Because of Easter... Because of what Jesus did for you, your risen Savior has taken away your guilt of your sin and my sin of unbelief. By his death, Jesus bought and brought peace between God and man. Every last sin was paid for. Every last bit of punishment was endured. His resurrection, his return to life is God's not guilty verdict on the world. And now the risen Jesus has brought that non-guilty verdict to his disciples and to you. In the risen Christ, all of our doubts have been paid for. Every last bit of unbelief has been atoned for. You and I are free, free from the guilt of our sins, the guilt of doubt. We are, are free to call a spade a spade, so to speak. We are free to point out the folly of our doubt and give it the proper name it deserves. When we talk about it, we don't need to sugarcoat our doubt or to cover it up. We are free not to keep living in our doubts to let Jesus remove every last doubt from our lives. And it only took one week for Jesus to do it for Thomas. After eight days, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. How is that fair? How, how is that fair? Thomas sins by doubting what his brothers in the Lord told him. Thomas demands that he won't believe that Jesus is alive unless he has proof, unless he can touch Jesus' wounds. Thomas demands, 
And Jesus gives him exactly what he asked for. Sure, it would be easy to stop doubting, to believe in Jesus, since he was standing there right in front of Thomas. So why can't Jesus do the same for us? Why do we always have to be the Thomas? From one doubting Thomas to another, those questions will enter our minds from time to time. We long greatly for proof, for something that we can hold on to, something we can grasp, and we'll look high and low. Maybe we'll gravitate to archaeological evidence of chariots found in the Red Sea. Maybe we'll flock to a four-year-old boy's story of going to heaven, and seeing Jesus, and then coming back. If someone would just come back from the dead and tell us, then we could know, like Thomas. But my dear friends, from one doubting Thomas to another, I, I caution you. When we go looking for evidence in those places, we, we might find it. I can't say that the chariots, the wheels of the chariots that were found in the Red Sea aren't from the time of Moses. However, it turns out that young four-year-old Colton was coached by his parents to say that he went to heaven and came back. And I seem to remember a story that Jesus told about a rich man and poor Lazarus. And when that rich man was suffering greatly in hell and he wanted Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead to go warn his five brothers, Abraham's words were pretty clear. They have Moses and the prophets. If they won't listen to them, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. We have something even greater than Moses and the prophets. We have the entire revealed word of God. We have God's inspired word, which tells us everything that we need. Just look at the last verse of this section. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in his name. Jesus has given us what we need. He has given us himself and his word. We can touch him and feel him and taste and see that the Lord is good in his supper. This is how God wanted it to be. In fact, this is how God wants people to believe, how he prefers that we believe. It's how you and I believe. We believe by hearing Jesus' words. That, after all, is what faith is. Faith is believing something even though you don't see it. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Paul told us we walk by faith and not by sight. But faith always has to be in something. Faith has to be built on something. Faith has to have an object. And faith is only as good as what you believe in. Our faith is built on Jesus' word. Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. We believe by hearing Jesus' words. It's his words that make the sacraments what they are. Martin Luther, in his small catechism, asked the question, how can water do such great things? And then he answered the question, it's certainly not the water which does such things, but God's word which is in and with the water. He posed a similar question about the Lord's Supper. How can eating and drinking do such great things? And he answered, it is certainly not the eating and drinking which does such things, but the words given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. These words are the main thing in the sacrament along with the eating and drinking. And whoever believes these words have what they plainly say, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' words are what make believers out of you and me. And so from one doubting Thomas to another, Jesus says, come back to my words. Keep hearing my words. My words will take away your doubts. My words will change your minds. 
My words will keep you believing. My words will lead you to say, my Lord and my God. Even though today is not Easter, today and every day are days when we can hear Jesus' words. Every time we worship, we are convinced again from the word that the impossible has happened. That one man came back from death. And that means that all will come back from death. Thomas believed by seeing Jesus' wounds. We don't have any wounds to see. We have words to hear. Let's keep hearing them. Let's keep hearing them and not get bored with them. Let's keep hearing them so that we believe them. From one doubting Thomas to another. As Jesus has said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen. Please stand. Now may that peace of God which surpasses our understanding may keep you in your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join to confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we join in the prayer of the church. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, you have made our joy complete. You have given us peace. You have given us your spirit. You have forgiven us and have driven away our doubts. You are our Lord. When our hearts are filled with many doubts, remind us that your word is true. With you at our right hand, we will not be shaken. You are our Lord. Let your message of peace and forgiveness reach those who have not heard it. Keep those who proclaim your message safe, and let their testimony bring new people into your church. You are our Lord. Apart from you, we have no good thing. Counsel and instruct all leaders, the president of our nation, the governor of our state, and all local authorities, that we may live peaceable lives, and that your gospel may be proclaimed freely. You are our Lord. Apart from you, we have no good thing. Guide and inspire those who lead the worship of your people that they may proclaim your good news in word and song, build your people up in faith, and lead them to sing your praises. You are our Lord. Apart from you, we have no <clears throat> Make your path of life known to those who are plagued with doubts and fears, those who suffer with pain and illness. You have given us your promise that you will not abandon us. You are our Lord. Apart from you, Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Lord, 
Lord Jesus Christ, true God and truly human, you do not change, and you are holy in all your works. Remove all our unbelief and doubt, and fill our hearts with the gifts of your grace, that we may believe and know you as our Lord and our God. For you live and reign now and forever. Amen. We thank God for the opportunity to return gifts to him to support the work he's given us to do here. If you did bring an offering this morning, you can place it in the box in the back. I'd like to take just a, a minute or so uh, it's t- and during this time for personal preparation for the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you'd like some help with that, on page 295 in the front of the hymnal, our list of Christian questions that you can read through uh, to help prepare your hearts to receive uh, Jesus' body blood for the forgiveness of your sins. So we'll just take a moment at this time for some personal preparation for Lord's Supper. Please stand as we join to celebrate the Sabbath. Thank you. 
are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love, you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy, you planned our salvation. In grace, you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God our Father, and to your Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, from the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. You have God's peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O God, the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we sing our closing hymn, hymn 830, We Walk by Faith. Miss Treater, 
If you're members of East Lutheran Church in school, several weeks ago you extended to me a divine call to serve as your third grade teacher and school music coordinator. After many conversations, prayerful deliberation, and trusting in the Holy Spirit's guidance, I am accepting the call to Eastside. It has been a joy to learn of your ministry and work for our Lord's kingdom. It is very evident that God has richly blessed your congregation and school, and I can also see the needs and challenges that are present as you carry out the mission of our Lord's church. I look forward to joining you in ministry and sharing the precious joy of our risen Savior. Please continue to pray for all the churches and schools of our synod, for pastors, teachers, and staff ministers, and the priesthood of all believers, that the Lord continues to bless his church and the spread of his gospel. As he promises, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Isaiah 55, 11. May God bless you and keep you in his care. Serving you in Christ, Mandy Treater. And then from Mr. Rank. Dear members of Eastside, thank you for all your thoughts, comments, and prayers that have been shared as my family and I have gone through the process of deliberating between the two calls to Eastside and faith. It has been such a blessing to have served and grown in ministry here in Madison. You have been my family, friends, supporters, and encouragers. My family and I have been extremely blessed beyond what any words can say to be part of this congregation and this ministry. It is with many and mixed emotions that I inform you that I have accepted the call to serve as principal at Faith Lutheran School in Fond du Lac. I have treasured my time at Eastside and have enjoyed working with all the students and families who have come through the classroom or school doors. It has been a blessing to have grown to know so many of the school and congregational families on such a personal basis. There have been many times and experiences that I will hold dear to my heart. This congregation has been supportive of the Lord's work in the school. I will continue to pray that the Lord's work be done in Madison. Be confident that the Lord has a plan for Eastside Lutheran Church and School, and will use the many talented and gifted staff and lay leaders of this congregation to assist in moving forward with the ministry of the school. Thank you for all that you have done for my family and me over the past 11 years. May God bless you in the work you will carry on to grow in Jesus and tell of his love in Christ's service, Benjamin Rank. So, yeah, this is good news for God's kingdom. So we have a call meeting today. Originally, the call meeting today was to call for a second pastor and potentially a third grade teacher if there was a pastor whose wife fit those gifts. Well, we've got the third grade teacher, but now we don't have a second grade teacher. So. We are going to have a call meeting today to call for a second pastor, and if the gifts of this pastor's wife fits, to teach second grade. If we don't find that to be the case, we are having a call meeting next Sunday, the 14th, at the same time, to call for a principal, and potentially a second grade teacher if we don't put that call up today. Okay, so just to recap, Call meeting this morning. President Jensen will be here to lead that meeting to call for a second pastor, potentially a second grade teacher. Call meeting next Sunday to call for a principal and potentially a second grade teacher. There is still Sunday school this morning, so for those of you going to Sunday school, please do that. Bible classes are re uh, ramping up again. Uh, our Wednesday evening Bible study that's been watching The Chosen will resume this Wednesday at 6.30. If you were part of a small group in the past, those small groups are firing up again for another six weeks. Um, if you want to be part of a small group, please talk to me and we'll get you connected to a group. Uh, for the facilitators who are here, all the questions and facilitators guides are in the office so you can get those on your way home today. I think that's everything. God's blessings to you. I'll get to the back. We'll greet you and hopefully many of you will stay for the call. Thank you.